Hello, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the second session of our international series of conversations on the test of proportionality. Today, we are extremely happy to have Professor Catherine Young with us. Professor Young is Professor and Distinguished Scholar at the Boston College. Without further ado, I leave you with Professor Yin. Thank you very much, Professor, for joining us and accepting our invitation. Thank you very much. And it's such an honor to be here. I'm very much uh, looking forward to the conversation after my presentation. And it's such a wonderful conference that you've amassed on the proportionality test. Uh, so it's wonderful to be part of it. So I'm going to share my PowerPoint screen which uh, contains my, my presentation on proportionality, backsliding, and economic and social rights. And I'm going to start by defining my terms a little bit at length, uh, because I'm putting those three concepts together uh, to see how they work uh, with one, one another. Um, if I can move to the overview of my presentation, uh, basically, I see that backsliding, which I'm going to define, um, backsliding of rights implicates the negative obligations that attach to economic and social rights. Uh, and in this way, the proportionality principle will play a relatively greater role in the interpretation and application of economic and social rights uh, by courts. Uh, at the same time, during periods of crisis in which we see the, this backsliding occur, I'll also be suggesting that the proportionality principle may be operating in its least robust form. Uh, that is its most moderate, most relaxed form. Uh, so that's basically the overview of the presentation, but I'm going to be indicating how this plays out, uh, particularly in light of constitutional doctrine, uh, mainly drawing from South Africa, which is where I've uh, studied the operation of proportionality to the greatest extent, as well as to some extent the international human rights doctrines that are veering towards a proportionality analysis uh, in contemplating economic and social rights interpretation and application. So I'm going to be drawing on a chapter that I wrote for a book on proportionality, New Frontiers, New Challenges, that came out in 2017 and was edited by Vicki Jackson and Mark Tushnet here in the United States. Um, and that's a very comparative uh, book uh, containing kind of defendants of proportionality, uh, Robert Alexi writing from Germany, David Beatty writing from Canada, and a host of other commentators really trying to focus on some of the big challenges as proportionality assumes its role as one of the biggest migrants in the recent migration of constitutional ideas across the world. I'll also be drawing on uh, some of the chapters that are included in my recent book, The Future of Economic and Social Rights, which came out in 2019 and contains both comparative constitutional analyses as well as international human rights analyses um, of the operation of economic and social rights at both a, an institutional, uh, very court-based level, um, as well as a doctrine. Um, so let me uh, move to define some of the terms economic and social rights, uh, backsliding and proportionality. And let me start with uh, a big uh, graph of economic and social rights moving throughout the world uh, and appearing in various constitutions, some in some cases appearing in uh, over two thirds of the world's constitutions. And I'm acknowledging that I'm talking to a, an audience in Mexico and Mexico uh, obviously lays claim to being the first constitution uh, to entrench economic and social rights uh, back in 1917. Um, the first to actually take the model of a written bill of rights from the United States Constitution and include economic and social rights within it. And I think my audience knows much more about the ebbs and flows of that protection, um, but it does, uh, it's right that Mexico Mexico can claim the constitutional um, pioneer in that respect. 
Um, of course, the US uh, subnational constitutions, the state constitutions had already entrenched a right to education or a duty to provide adequate education in many of the state constitutions at the time. Uh, and there are other landmark constitutions that we can see, um, and we don't have to adopt a chronology to show their influence, but of course, the post-independence constitution of India was a real pioneer in including economic and social rights as directive principles of state policy, which were expressly meant not to be justiciable, but, but nevertheless uh, to be an important influence on policy as the, as the state was devising uh, uh, laws. Um, and then there are other very important doctrines, the Sozialstaat principle from, from um, Germany, the social rule of law principle extending throughout Europe and Latin America. Um, and uh, then we see the wave of constitutions after 1989 becoming influential, uh, uh, including the post-communist states of Eastern Europe, um, including, of course, uh, more uh, economic and social rights protections uh, in, at the insistence of drafters in Latin America, um, and then the South African constitution of 1996, which is the focus of my study. Um, we've also seen later uh, additions, amendments and reforms towards economic and social rights. And in this respect, I include this second graph. And let me just say a little bit more about these graphs. Um, there's been many quantitative exercises of assessing textual uh, imports and exports and migrations around the constitutions of the world. Um, and they've been very helpful to provide a kind of textual snapshot of what's happening, um, although they don't say much about under the, <laughs> under the text how various provisions have been enforced. But I think it's helpful to see this study by Courtney Young, Rand Herschel and Evan Rosevia in 2014. Uh, they certainly counted the prevalence of various texts to see that there were what they called standard economic and social rights, education and healthcare and social security, for example, being very influential in different constitutions. Um, and then what they called uh, non-standard economic and social rights being far rarer, uh, land uh, development, and rights to food and water and healthy work. Um, housing, the right to housing is becoming uh, more entrenched. The right to healthcare too is not only becoming more entrenched around the world, but more uh, justiciable. And one of the things that uh, these authors do in their qu quantitative exercise is to differentiate between those rights that are expressly justiciable, that is that judges can, uh, can uh, adjudicate on claims they raise a cause of action or otherwise adjudicate on disputes underlying uh, such rights as uh, subjective claims. Uh, versus the more aspirational uh, idea that such rights are supposed to guide policy uh, and guide policy decisions, um, but not be touched by courts. Um, clearly, again, under the radar, under the text, the distinction between justiciable and aspirational is far more complex um, because courts do find ways of adjudicating economic and social rights when they adjudicate justiciable rights, such as the right to life. Um, the table uh, uh, over here that is included in my recent uh, edited collection shows the change between 2000 and 2016. Um, and that change is a change that shows a trend of greater inclusion of economic and social rights, particularly the right to health care and the right to a healthy environment, as well as a greater tendency to make such rights justiciable thereby demanding a standard of adjudication in which I'm going to say that proportionality plays a role. Um, but I thought it would be useful to provide that background at the constitutional level of developments towards economic and social rights. Again, I think this audience is very familiar with those. Um, next, I want to talk uh, briefly about international human rights law. Um, there we see, of course, uh, the uh, original kind of post-World War II settlement as one in which economic and social rights were supposed to feature heavily. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights uh, entrenches various economic and social rights um, in, in, and it does so with a kind of idea that freedom from want should play as great a role in the interpretation of human rights um, as freedom of, of, from, of worship, freedom of speech and so forth. 
Um, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is also accompanied by the American Declaration of Human Rights. Um, and then these are very relevant for constitutions such as Mexico's, which incorporate international human rights law within their constitutional provisions. And so I thought it would be worth stipulating that the Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights now has uh, 171 state parties um, and some of these do much more than others to expressly incorporate economic and social rights in legislation or constitutions. Um, and then there's also the recent optional protocol to the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. Um, now uh, with 26 state parties, um, including eight from Latin America. Um, and that optional protocol gives the committee, the International Human Rights Treaty Body that interprets those economic and social rights, the express, express authority to hear complaints um, most of these so far have come out of individual complaints against Spain, um, but the committee now actually works as an, an adjudicator to some extent, listening to complaints about economic and social rights uh, infringements and applying conceptions of proportionality and other doctrines to try and work out whether um, such rights have indeed um, been violated. Um, of course, I put this on the board. There's a host of other human rights treaties, core human rights treaties, which entrench economic and social rights from the Convention on the Elimination of, of Racial Discrimination, the Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, the Convention on the Rights of the Child, the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. I don't want to uh, suggest that these are the only treaties that are relevant. Um, and all of the core human rights treaties are interpreted with an idea that human rights are uh, interconnected and interdependent and indivisible uh, insofar as proportionality applies to civil and political rights. It's also uh, thought to apply to economic and social rights. Um, similarly, just in terms of transnational law, we're seeing a real uh, and continued rise in transnationally connected social movements that are agitating around economic and social rights, um, agitating at the United Nations level or at the regional level in the inter-American system and the European system. Um, and we're seeing their, 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 their complaints formulated around the rights to housing or healthcare or food or water and sanitation, um, as well as rights related to work. Um, and there are many special procedures within the UN that are openly uh, ad adopting a mandate to report on rights infringement at that level. Um, so there's a space in which a lot of agitation is taking place and a lot of um, measurement. I want to say that the trend uh, to just disability is reflected in this optional protocol. So insofar as we're seeing more justiciability, more court involvement around interpreting economic and social rights at the national level, so too are we seeing this at the international level. Um, so let me move to uh, inter kind of define my terms of backsliding now that I've defined economic and social rights. Um, we're all very familiar, I think, with the literature and the observations about democratic and constitutional backsliding. Um, and this is often described in terms of democratic decline or decay, um, constitutional crisis, constitutional rot, a real sense that there has been regress rather than progress in various liberal democratic commitments. Um, these, these fall under our protections of civil and political rights, but they can't be reduced to that even though it's very hard to say what a civil and political right uh, is reduced to, but there is far more going on than simply the infringement of civil and political rights in the democratic and constitutional backsliding story. Nonetheless, it's a story to worth bearing in, uh, that, that's worth bearing in mind. Um, the various indicators pit either 2011 or 2006 as the last time we saw a peak in uh, constitutional uh, liberal protections, including of civil and political rights, and we can look at various measures and indicators and indexes for, uh, for the empirical evidence of these trends. And I'm just including here the Freedom House's Freedom in the World report, which, is, um, which contains um, some empirical data. Again, it's uh, sometimes very controversial. The Ec Economist's Intelligent Units Democracy Index also reports on what has been um, a high point uh, in, in liberal democratic protections and what is now uh, being seen as a period of pretty consistent decline. 
Um, of course, there are periods of progress and periods of regress and commentators do comment that these things can be cyclical, uh, but nevertheless, it's a pretty standard comment that democracy takes much longer to build than it does to destroy. So some of the more alar alarming uh, statistics about decline and measurement of, uh, of various indicators showing uh, 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 worldwide decline um, really give some, some cause for concern. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about those, those indicators. Of course, the story is a worldwide story, but nonetheless, there are exceptions of some places that are really undergoing uh, experiences of, of, of greater democratic and constitutional protection. So it's not a universal, uniform decline, um, but in the aggregate, uh, it's much more often a decline than otherwise. As well as these measures, we have a series of measures that have become more and more popular in the last years that try to measure economic and social rights realization. Uh, the Human Development Index was one of the first to do this, to expand beyond the GDP index to take into account uh, life expectancy and literacy and various other measures uh, and plot these uh, against GDP to show a much more complex story of uh, achievement of various countries. Um, recently, there's been a social and economic rights fulfillment index, which measures not only the fulfillment of um, particular uh, 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 standards of protection, um, but measures that against the available resources each country has to invest um, and plots countries that way. Um, and at the same time, as well as these um, indexes uh, keep up with trends, we see a massive decline in these protections uh, since COVID-19. And so I'm just going to show a slide of some of these uh, indicators um, very briefly. Um, the first being the Freedom Score Index, which shows um, civil and uh, political rights regress um, countries from 2019 to 2020 um, becoming less free. Um, and then you see a, a small number becoming more free um, in the last period. We also see the Global Democracy Index measuring uh, civil and political rights, um, as well as uh, various aspects of, of uh, societal trust and tolerance, um, associational bonds, political knowledge, electoral turnout, uh, corruption. These kinds of things are measured in terms of uh, democracy indexes, which suggest decline. I've also added in the Quantitative Human Rights uh, Measurement Index's Rights Tracker which plots economic and social rights fulfillment uh, in the way I mentioned. Um, and then finally, um, a map delivered by the World Bank on um, poverty scores, which shows um, immense decline uh, since COVID, um, actually unprecedented in the world in terms of uh, what an increase in global poverty it has signaled with 97 uh, million more people living in poverty um, uh, uh, since COVID than before. Um, and so that's very salutary to see um, how economic and social rights have played out um, after both the, the health and the economic crises produced by the global pandemic. Um, so obviously there's a huge debate about these indicators and what they mean and what's not measured. Um, obviously in this, in this session, we don't need to get into those debates, but I'm trying to just provide one snapshot of a mixed series of indicators of backsliding around the world, which reaches into economic and social rights as well as civil and political rights, although the stories of course are, are, are varied. Um, just in brief, the trending threats to economic and social rights come out um, in many studies. Um, many of these studies are connected to uh, UN reports or social movements. And so I've seen from the global north um, a lot of studies concerning the threats of um, austeri uh, um, austerity, um, uh, cuts to social services, uh, cuts to healthcare, and so forth. Uh, financialization, cuts to housing protections or increases in unaffordability of housing, um, privatization uh, policies, um, economic inequality, digital technologies, environmental degradation, and gender inequality and how that is felt by women, children and vulnerable people. And so a lot of social movements and other actors mounting claims around economic and social rights are pointing to these policies as the cause of the threat um, and claiming that the state has to do better 
for example, if privatisation is pursued, then an alternative uh, net has to be provided or some other alternative has to be there to ensure um, universal access to such, such a good. So these are the kinds of claims that I see. Um, and then you see the same things occupying claimants in the global south. But what has also been distinctive is a lot of pressure uh, put on social adjustment policies in the shadow of those um, land acquisition, displacement, water, sanitation, neglected diseases, concerns, food prices, uh, the resource curse in, in some countries, um, unequal effects of investment and trade, unequal rewards from supply chains, um, extreme poverty, foreign debt, and the disproportionate burden of the climate crisis. Uh, and so I've seen these as constantly accompanying reports about economic and social rights violations. And I thought it useful to collect these together. Uh, it's worth stipulating that the divisions between the global north and the global south are, are um, are noticeable in terms of available resources and kind of the structure of the global economy. Nonetheless, they do blur and you see transnational links between social movements in different places. And you see the impacts on vulnerable people um, often point to intersectional disadvantage, which is the same uh, disadvantage, obviously not uniform, but uh, it sounds in race or ethnicity, gender, sex, sexual orientation, religion, disability, national origin socioeconomic status and um, these kinds of uh, characteristics. Um, as far as COVID-19 goes, as I mentioned, this is a health crisis and it's also an economic crisis. Um, and so there are demands that have been put on the right to health um, and uh, the incapacity of public health policies to appropriately give respect to the right to health, uh, the demands on the right to sanitation, to information, and also a significant demand on, on housing uh, in some places. Um, we also see that there have been uh, sometimes countervailing demands around the protection of civil and political rights, the right to associate, freedom of movement, um, the right to education, um, and the way um, many people have thought through the clear impositions that have been made on civil and political rights is through a principle of proportionality. That is that any limitations that have been made for the purposes of public health have to be justifiable and proportionate. Um, and we see that that discourse playing out um, in uh, against many protesters of, of very severe uh, lockdown policies and, and, and the like. Um, so let me just finally define the last term, proportionality. Um, and obviously, I think this, this audience doesn't require much of a definition. Um, but proportionate, proportionality uh, is a striking kind of doctrine at the constitutional level given that it is a standard-based doctrine of application rather than a categorical uh, doctrine of the meaning of a right that is protected as a trump or a firewall um, by courts. Um, it also compares uh, quite distinctively from approaches that rely on fidelity to text or fidelity to origins. And I'm coming to you from the United States where originalism plays an, an extremely large role in constitutional interpretation. So proportionality is extraordinarily distinctive um, from those things. Um, and there are obviously various theories about how it works. Um, Robert Alexi's idea that rights represent principles that need to be optimized has been obviously a very influential one. Um, David Beattie's from Canada sees proportionality as the ultimate rule of law principle. Uh, and so too does Aron Barak, for example, see proportionality as really representing the inherent rationality and reasonableness of law. Um, so there are various views of what proportionality is. And given I've been trained in a common law system, I obviously see a, uh, a kind of uh, principle at work uh, that doesn't necessarily occupy the place of a structured doctrine. Um, but I've also been trained in Germany and understand the power of a doctrine in a civil law system as well. 
Um, and so I uh, have looked at proportionality operating in both senses, uh, in the civil law sense, um, but also as it has been interpreted in Canada and so forth, we see proportionality operating as a very structured doctrine, which obviously contains three or four stages, depending on, on how one interprets it, um, so that whenever a government is seen to be infringing a constitutionally protected right, it needs to prove um, four things, uh, depending on how you carve it up. Um, first, that the government is act acting with an objective which is legitimate and important. Secondly, that the means that the government chose were rationally connected to achieve that objective, which is the suitability requirement. Um, thirdly, that there were no um, less restrictive uh, or drastic measures available, which is the necessity test. And fourth, that the benefit from realizing this objective exceeds the harm that the right uh, um, is experiencing. And this is said to be proportionality in the strict sense. And so given the formula available for judges as they work out whether a rights um, pressure is justifiable, the pressure to the right has been justified according to the stages, um, we see a very disciplined inquiry take place. Um, and then judges have to evaluate at each stage um, the proportionality of each uh, move. And as I said, this kind of structured doctrine has become uh, such an, a successful uh, migrant in the world of constitutional ideas. Um, its origins are very complex, but um, many would say it, it first originated in Germany in the administrative law context. Um, and I look to uh, Ido Porat's work on this. Others would claim that it also has Anglo administrative law origins, um, that it looks very much like the Weds Wednesbury test of, of rationality review ramped up in intensity, therefore uh, coming from the UK. But the, the standard story is that it has German origins, which moved to the European Court of Human Rights, um, then moved throughout Western Europe and Canada, um, and after was resettled into Eastern Europe, Latin America, and South Africa. Um, and so we're going to follow that last step um, of migration um, by going now to South Africa. But as I said, the story of origins is a disputed one. Um, and I think depending on the conception of proportionality that one holds, one does see um, a different influence of, of different uh, features of law. Uh, the structured doctrine may be one that appeals very much to a, the, the German setting. Um, nevertheless, the idea of proportionality as a principle that inflects decision making certainly does have parallels with administrative review um, in the um, Anglo common law system. And here I'm, I'm suggesting the principle of policing the boundaries of the, of the reasonable relates to the earlier uh, focus of judges to never allow the state to be unreasonable or um, manifestly unreasonable in its actions. And so it's a flip side to then move to assessing the reasonableness of the state's actions rather than its, its, um, its manifest unreasonableness. And there we see it as a principle that guides a kind of rationality review ramped up to the reasonableness re uh, review that we see in South African constitutional law. I want to say both of the proportionality as a structured doctrine and as a principle represents a culture of justification. That is that the state has to justify itself. Um, Matthias Kuhn has written about this, but Etienne Murenek, a South African administrative lawyer, used the principle of the culture of justification as one of the biggest, uh, def biggest principles to defend an economic and social rights-based constitution. So he saw um, many of the opponents of economic and social rights were really, really worrying about the increase of, the ju of judicial power, um, the kind of unintended cons consequences of including constitutionally protected economic and social rights. He answered that at least one gets a culture of justification. Courts shouldn't do more than seek justification, but seeking justification for moves that infringe economic and social rights he thought would be a very protective feature of the new South African constitutional order. And we see that culture of justification calibrated in relation to economic and social rights with the principle that the graver the impact of 
of a decision upon an individual affected by it, the more substantial the justification will be required. Um, and that is a principle that certainly goes into the reasonableness inquiry that I'm going to talk about. So let me, before moving to South Africa, note that economic and social rights uh, uh, are often described as positive rights, which is an inaccurate uh, description. Um, economic and social rights have both positive and negative features, um, and one can demarcate them as kind of, uh, you know, occupying both negative obligations on the state to restrain itself and positive obligations on the state to actively protect um, and fulfill uh, particular rights. Um, insofar as the positive obligations are laid out, uh, one sees in the textual instruments, both the international human rights treaties and the various constitutional provisions, that positive obligations are saturated by standards, um, that the rights to education or healthcare or housing need to be adequacy, adequate or appropriate, um, that the state has to progressively realize them according to its available resources, sometimes maximum available resources, so in that sense, the rights themselves are qualified by, by what resources are available and what the sense is of the particular context in which such right requires protection. The negative obligations aren't saturated by standards to the same degree. Um, we see obligations on the state to restrain itself from, for example, arbitrary eviction or from, the, from, from permitting uh, housing foreclosures without due process. These are very property-like protections. And I don't want to say that resources aren't implicated in negative obligations, although the court itself doesn't appear to be uh, assessing different resources and costs, um, the contravention of negative obligations can represent a huge windfall for the state. Um, there can be incredible resources on the line when it engages in this kind of activity, which the court would be preventing um, in enforcing an economic and social right against it. Um, so South Africa, turning to South Africa, um, South Africa is of course a, 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 an instance of transformative constitutionalism, um, in a sense coined by Carl Clare, that is the constitution was set out in order to serve as a bridge from the previous uh, apartheid order into the post-apartheid order. Uh, so it wasn't a constitution that was established to preserve a particular arrangement. In Carl Clare's formulation, it's, it's explicitly required to transform uh, social relations and legal relations in a direction away from the injustices of apartheid. Uh, and so we see transformative constitutionalism also occupying many other constitutions that have been formulated after um, these kinds of grievances or conflict. Um, South Africa there, there um, buys a pioneer in economic and social rights protection. It sets out a degree of um, protected economic and social rights, children's rights and civil and political rights um, within its Bill of Rights. And these are governed by a limitations clause, which is relevant to the proportionality requirement uh, in, in the sense that all rights are protected but subject to limitation if it is necessary and proportionate in an open and democratic society. And this kind of limitations clause is borrowed from the Canadian system and operates to ensure that the government isn't constricted absolutely by categor categorical absolutist rights. Uh, it can uh, derogate from particular rights, but it must do so uh, only through a justification of why it was necessary and proportionate to do so. Um, that's the external limitations clause, which attaches to all of the rights of the Bill of Rights, by some exceptions. The internal limitations clause uh, is occupied at the level of each economic and social right, in the sense that those rights uh, don't have um, will have an additional qualification, which is that they must be uh, realized um, through reasonable legislative and other measures subject to available resources. Um, so that kind of caveat has been described as an internal limitation, um, setting up a different proportionality requirement than the civil and political rights has. Um, and People, I guess, uh, after 1996, after the interim constitution was then um, uh, 
was uh, then replaced with the final constitution uh, after its certification by the court, which said, yes, we will be uh, subjecting economic and social rights to judicial review. Um, at the very least, we'll be, we will be protecting them from improper invasion. Um, the, the scholars and commentators uh, wondered where, where was the court going to go with its economic and social rights jurisprudence. And after a few cases, a few earlier cases involving the right to health, um, the court settled on the group room decision, a right to housing decision in 2001, which has really been canonical in the area of economic and social rights on the global scale. Um, and in that case, the, the group room decision, the court established that it would inquire as to the reasonableness of the government's actions in, in um, in limiting or, or um, not realizing the right to housing. Um, and so a little background to that case, which is a very familiar case, I'm sure, to this audience, is that the case was brought by Irene Groupboom and her community who had been evicted uh, from a couple of places and had been um, uh, kind of forced onto a soccer field um, just in need of housing waiting on a soccer field for a, a place to live um, and really uh, subject to uh, uh, very little protections um, kind of camped out on the soccer field uh, a large community with with families and children um, and a local lawyer brought their ca their case um, and it went all the way up to the constitutional court and the Constitutional Court had to ask itself, um, have, have, you know, are there, is there an infringement of uh, the right to housing, which we're, we're, um, we're required to adjudicate as, um, as subject to available resources? Um, we know that there is a housing policy which has been worked out, which sets up a waiting list for um, new housing that's being developed. For various people. We know the legacy of apartheid has created huge economic injustices uh, and that groups such as um, such as uh, I mean Group Boom's community are waiting for their housing to be built. Um, nonetheless, we see that the housing policies that have been established uh, are not able to cater for people in crisis conditions such as the Irene Group Boom community um, is finding itself in. And therefore, the housing policy itself is declared as unconstitutional for not catering for those crisis conditions. But the basic baseline that the court sets is, it, is that it's unreasonable for a housing policy to be established without catering to the needs of the most vulnerable. Uh, and therefore, it sends the housing policy back to the drawing board um, and the state has to come up with an alternative housing policy that does make an allowance not only for those on the waiting list um, and for various other situated uh, uh, beneficiaries of housing rights, but also for the needs of the most vulnerable. So emergency housing that's very urgent um, and it takes four years, but a housing policy is, is produced that does cater for um, groups in Irene Groupum's position. Um, so I mentioned that case at some length uh, because of the various options available to the court to adjudicate. One option that had been uh, uh, argued before the court was to entrench a minimum core of housing. Uh, that Irene Groupum's community represented the, the absolute baseline for what the right to housing should be protecting and that the court should recognize that minimum core uh, and thereby recognize her and her community's right to housing. And the court itself said, we hear these arguments about the minimum core. The minimum core idea is not an unfamiliar idea. It's there present in international human rights law. The Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights has declared that there is a minimum core that that should be available in every country, every state party must comply with at least the minimum core of each right. Uh, but we as a constitutional court do not feel equipped to make that determination as to what a minimum core looks like. We feel only equipped to make the determination as to whether the government has acted reasonably or 
uh, information that may be relevant to establishing a minimum, information such as the vulnerability of the community as relative to other communities, will go into that evaluation of reasonableness, but we don't feel equipped to actually stipulate what that minimum cost should be, um, nor are we going to create an independent cause of action that points to exactly uh, the right to housing that can always be brought. So this is a very deferential but nevertheless robust defense of housing since a violation is ultimately found but it's found with a, a more relaxed assessment of the reasonableness of government policy. Um, we could say that um, this might represent the last prong of proportionality because there is a calibrated inqu inquiry as to the impact of very vulnerable groups for the emission uh, of their interests in a housing policy. But the court isn't interested in structuring the inquiry in that way. Um, it instead provides a very holistic assessment of reasonableness without embarking on a, a staged inquiry as to the necessity and suitability of the housing policy itself. So um, this comes from, I guess, antecedent uh, viewpoints of proportionality in civil and political rights cases. So under the interim constitution, the South African Constitutional Court uh, in another very famous decision uh, decided that the death penalty was unconstitutional uh, according to um, South Africa's uh, own principles of protection. And in the words of that judgment, the court found that proportionality required a balancing exercise and a global judgment to be made on the part of the court. Um, but the court was not keen to adhere to a sequential checklist. Um, and so the court dismissed that mechanical sequential checklist of proportionality analysis and instead undertook a kind of more global balancing. Um, so that was the 1995 decision and you kind of see that carrying through in the posture of the group boom court to the right to housing. Um, since that time, we've seen uh, the limitations clause invoked in Makwanyane, the idea that a, a right can be limited if necessary and proportionate in an open and democratic society. Um, we've seen that being applied to economic and social rights in relation to both its negative and positive guise. We've seen that um, in the Jafta case um, that uh, Sandra Liebenberg has written about, we see that legislation um, that permitted the sale of um, a person's home uh, under uh, mortgage proceedings uh, because of their failure to pay, uh, pay off a very petty debt was unproportional um, to, uh, to meeting um, more mortgage requirements. Um, the court decided that given the importance of access to adequate housing, uh, given the importance of the dignity of the occupant, um, given the severity of the impact on indigent debtors and the existence of alternative and less, less restrictive measures of fulfilling um, debt, then the court decided it was disproportionate to allow um, mortgages to be uh, foreclosed on the basis of a failure to um, dismiss and discharge a petty debt. Um, so we see proportionality operating in the Jafta case uh, in, in a very classical way. We also see it operating in the Causa case in which the court found that the exclusion of permanent residents from the government's social assistance scheme was unfair discrimination and was an unreasonable and unjustifiable limitation on the right to social security. Um, and again, the court is able to, to, to apply a kind of proportionality analysis to what would be reasonable to include and exclude. It finds that in the social security grant, simply um, dismissing permanent residents as beneficiaries interfered both with the right to social security and the right to equality and to be free from unfair discrimination. And a combination of those two things meant the court looked to the limitation clause but rejected the limitation as justifiable. And we, so we do see these structured inquiries, uh, somewhat structured inquiries, and the external limitations clause playing a part in the economic and social rights decisions. Um, but we see a host of other decisions in which the court is far more content to rest on the reasonableness inquiry. 
um, and in the q and I'm happy to go through some of those decisions. Um, but in my analysis, how the reasonableness inquiry differs from proportionality is that it becomes a much more incremental and contextual articulation of the right. So we see the right to water, the right to housing and so forth articulated in a way that isn't maximalist in the sense that those reporting on proportionality uh, and the um, accompanying issue of rights inflation suggests that it invites. So those who describe the structured test of proportionality invite a very capacious reference to the right in the first stage. Uh, and so the applicant has to argue that the right exists, um, but there can be su such a thing as a right to feed pigeons in the park is the kind of quintessential um, example given. In, under the reasonableness inquiry, the right is already reduced in content at the very first stage. Um, so it's not maximally interpreted. It's still just an incremental and very context-based interpretation of what that right should mean. We also see a different op operation of deference. Um, so many scholars have reported on the, the deference that is immediately invoked in economic and social rights cases, um, where the courts do restrain their, their reactions. Um, and this is done because of both epistemic problems. The courts are not expert in the, in the area. They lack the information. They lack the, the technical capacity to deal with some of these issues. And so you see deference being applied on the basis of an epistemic value, but also deference on the basis of a democracy value. That is courts are not going to be ultimately accountable for their decisions and th so they shouldn't overstep their mark. And you see within reasonableness, the deference is boiled into the test itself. Um, so reasonableness is already applied, being very deferential to the government, um, which is quite different again from the structured test, where the court may be uh, far more robust in structuring its inquiry, but at any stage it might deliver a margin of appreciation and kind of allow for um, a space between what it thinks and what the, how the government is acting. Again, that's a far more structured way of applying deference. And we see the limitations inquiry, inquiry itself quite different uh, in the reasonableness review standard and the structured test of proportionality. Nonetheless, I've concluded that what I see in South Africa is what I've described as proportionality inflected reasonableness. Um, there is a sense of the principle of proportionality, um, but not the structured test. I wanted to just say a little bit where the, the doctrine is heading in international human rights law as well as South Africa. So in the very famous general comment number three on economic and social rights, where the minimum core was articulated by the committee, there was an, also an, a, a, an articulation that any retrogression of rights should be subject to justification. Um, and this was sometimes described as a prohibition on retrogression without due justification. In a far later general comment dealing with social security in number 19, the, the committee stipulates that any deliberate retrogression is subject to justification, including a description of the impact on particular groups. So again, the, the committee is trending towards requiring transparency and accountability and elucidation of the justification of any burdens on economic and social rights. We see when the optional protocol is drafted uh, that the committee becomes then subject to consider the reasonableness of the steps taken by a state party. And so under the optional protocol, again, with 26 state parties, um, those, those parties have to have shown that they've been reasonable in their, in their policies which, which burden economic and social rights. And the, the committee has said it will consider where several policy options are available that the state party has to adopt the one that least restricts covenant rights. Um, again, after the financial crisis of 2008, uh, the committee issued a letter to state parties in response to the um, policies that they had adopted after the financial crisis. Uh, and the letter stipulated that all policy responses should be necessary and proportionate in the sense that the adoption of any other policy or a failure to act would be detrimental to economic, social and cultural rights. 
So this is a pretty high standard for a state to be dealing with crisis where the committee basically says you have to show that that was your only option to protect economic and social rights. Um, in that letter, uh, the court was, the committee was dealing with a series of examples that came out of the financial crisis, including a La the Latvian court's rejection of social security reforms and the German constitutional court's rejections of social security cuts that had not been based on, on evidence according to the court. And so there was this sense in which the committee was acting to um, forestall a lot of policies that um, that would be um, disproportionate to the most vulnerable uh, in relation to financial crisis. Um, the committee uh, was criticised by how late this letter had come, you know, four years after the financial crisis. Um, but in the early days of that crisis, there were many responses, and it was two years afterwards that one really saw the impact on vulnerable groups um, with austerity policies and the like. So I just want to mention three challenges that I uh, that I suggest occupy this space of proportionality um, when it's applied to economic and social rights and backsliding. The first is that the kind of crises in which we're seeing these backslidings uh, occur is a, a context which compels deference on the part of the court. Um, so it's an age old problem with economic and social rights that with too little deference, the court usurps the, the legislative and executive branches. Uh, and then you have a juristocracy um, with too much deference, the court abdicates its role as a defendant of constitutional rights. Um, so that's the difficult equation that the courts have to mediate in every economic and social rights dispute. Uh, but in the context of crisis, that becomes a far, far more difficult line to, to, um, to, to kind of uh, hold on to. Um, deference seems to be the, the, the best recipe for allowing a government to overcome a crisis. And this problem particularly relates to the least restrictive means analysis. Um, although arguably um, you could say it's still useful to engage in proportionality analysis. Um, the critiques of the South African court's water decision in Mazabuku said that there was too much deference applied. Um, and so some kind of proportionality test where the court had been forced to look at alternative options than the, the, the the water meters that were the subject of that dispute um, might have been a better resolution of that case. So there, there, there's a, a lot of commentary on where, what, what is too much and what is too little deference. Um, and certainly in uh, some education cases analyzed in Indonesia and in the United States, there has been an idea that at least proportionality can broaden a discourse um, or at least the pressure on the court to look at um, less restrictive means can broaden a discourse about taxing and spending in the context of education and financial crisis. Uh, the second challenge is the dollars versus rights framing that proportionality can uh, invite in the context of economic and social rights cases. Um, it's been established in, in jurisdictions now that courts uh, adjudicating economic and social rights can uh, review a budget to see what's what's left in, uh, what's left out. Um, so the Blue Moonlight decision in 2012 in South Africa is a, is a good example of uh, budgetary decisions and even a duty to plan and budget comes under economic and social rights review. Um, but when a proportionality uh, framework is, is given, then the, the court is faced with assessing dollars versus rights. And uh, a Canadian example from 2004 shows how challenging it is for a court to make the determination in the context of a financial crisis that some money should have been saved in a different way that didn't impact on rights in the way it had. Um, there is an idea that through proportionality analysis, if the government's trying to save costs, the, the court might decide, well, that wasn't necessary because you could have offset those costs somewhere else, um, or that wasn't the least restrictive means that you undertook because you could have, have, have done it differently. Um, but courts are very uncomfortable making that kind of determination. I think it really puts out, uh, puts, puts their necks out uh, on the on the block. They, they kind of lack the, the political capital often to make those kinds of calls on um, budgetary determinations. Um, the third challenge I want to suggest quickly 
is the idea that proportionality can occupy both ex post and ex ante reviews and in the ex ante review stage um, proportionality sets up um, impact assessments in a particular way in which it may give um, due to too much focus to negative obligations and not enough to positive obligations. Um, this relates to the, the large literature on it um, that alleges a middle class bias in economic and social rights determinations. Um, some, uh, some people have defended that bias if the bias does exist. Um, but there's a sense that if you're undertaking an ex ante assessment of various policies dealing with crisis and you have to show um, how the least restrictive means is, is being undertaken, you might look too much to negative obligations for people who are about to, to lose something and not the positive obligations uh, for those who are, uh, still fail to be um, protected um, in various policies. And I want to point to um, some movement in this area, again, out, out of South Africa, which was the acting chairperson of the Financial and Fiscal Commission, um, Michael Sachs's report on the 2021 budget in South Africa, um, who really tried to bring impact assessment to the table to show that the budget was simply not catering for economic and social rights. Um, I, I'll Note too that in terms of positive obligations, I've already identified in previous work that um, the conception of progressive realization around economic and social rights can leave great swathes of, of, of beneficiaries completely um, uh, uncatered for um, and in a position of waiting for their rights to be realized. Um, and I've documented what impacts that that can have on their own political agency. Um, okay, so in conclusion, I see that I'm, I'm running over time. Um, I do want to suggest that the negative obligations are the ones that are most implicated in times of backsliding and crisis. Um, the proportionality principle plays the greater role here than in other assessments of economic and social rights. But uh, during these periods, um, it may be at its least robust. Um, so I'll end there for your questions and comments. Thank you very much, Professor Yun. It was a thorough, interesting presentation about a pressing issue, highly discussed in highly, in highly relevant social rights, especially in the perspective of adjudication through the test of proportionality. There are many questions. I will group them up. as to facilitate the dialogue. And I think that there are three main question categories. The first have to do with social rights, their concept, their scope, their breadth. There are other questions on how the rights are adjudicated through the test of proportionality and if the critique or the concerns about the admissibility of that adjudication can also be applied whenever we're talking about social rights. And third, there are recurring questions about the COVID-19 crisis and social rights and adjudication through the test of proportionality. So I'm going to start by the more general questions about social rights. There's a group of uh, in, in the audience who wants to know what's your position regarding the distinction between social rights and economic, civil, and political rights. That is to say, is it a prevailing distinction? At least theoretically, should it be maintained? Because it seems that what the distinction does is to put social rights in the second term as if they were less relevant rights regarding the civil and political rights. And it seems there is in both a national and international practice regarding the improved or less importance of social or uh, political rights. The 
Inter-American Court of Human Rights has many decisions on political rights, but relatively few regarding social rights. So it sh do, shall we keep up with it? Is it worth maintaining that distinction between social political rights? And second, what's the usefulness in case it's worth doing so? Thank you. Great question. Uh, I, I think uh, within human rights law, we have been under the thrall of um, these categories for too long, uh, that uh, since 1993, the UN did come out with the doctrine, which it had actually hinted at before then in Tehran, but um, in the Vienna conference, that all rights are indivisible, interconnected, and interrelated, and that you cannot have one without the other. You know, the right to vote makes no sense if you're hungry. Uh, the right to food makes no sense if you have no um, uh, uh, agency or governance over, over how that food is produced or, or given to you or grown and so forth. So there um, has been many, many efforts to show how they're related. In the recent uh, Oxford Handbook of Economic and Social Rights um, that I'm co-editing with Malcolm Langford, we have a chapter by James Nicholl who goes through the linkages ar arguments um, uh, which wouldn't be to collapse the categories altogether to show how they're all related to human dignity, for example, but actually to show how they link into each other in different ways um, so that, um, you know, this, the every civil and political right is bolstered by various welfare or, um, or autonomy or dignity arguments. Um, so he, he tries to use linkage as, as a Interlink, interlinking category that allows each category to stand but to, to, to support each other. Um, there's obviously real problems with the generational view of the first generation, the second generation and the third generation of human rights and I, I think um, there's been some great work by Charles Walton and Stephen Jensen and others to show how economic and social rights belong at the first moment and even before the long history of economic and social rights shows that these are seen as uh, integral to the human person even earlier in some cases than civil and political rights and so the generational view kind of doesn't make sense it's just been a hur heuristic um, that people have used to justify hierarchies that really um, don't apply i mean Obviously, these hierarchies were influential during the Cold War, and there's all sorts of geopolitical reasons to separate the Civil and Political Rights Convention with the Economic, Social and Cultural Rights Convention. Um, but the later conventions don't separate them in this way. Um, I think the biggest separation is the duties that follow. Uh, so if there are duties to respect and protect and fulfill human rights, you see them apply across the board, civil, political, economic, social, cultural. Um, you know, generation uh, the environmental uh, rights um, occupying all of those tiers as well. Um, so the duties to respect, I think, are easiest for courts to handle because they don't put the courts in these same difficult positions of assessing positive obligations and forcing the government and inert or unresponsive government to act. Um, Instead, the court is saying stop acting. Um, and that's something that I think courts have traditionally found easier to do. Uh, so the duty to respect um, may uh, be better suited for adjudication uh, and the duty to um, uh, protect as well, which can involve private relations, um, property rights, contract rights, um, private relations between uh, individuals where the state is the background uh, enforcing the duties between each. Um, the duty to fulfill, uh, I think, is the most difficult for courts. You might want to see uh, different formulations of government, you know, commissions, um, ombudspersons, other forms of accountability established, new institutions established to assess duties to fulfill. Um, I think that's a better kind of category than simply falling into civil and political rights is the highest in the hierarchy, economic and social rights only being protected in so, insofar as they support 
civil and political rights, which I think has been the kind of less is more thesis in the inter-American system. Um, so yes, I, I think it's time to dispense with the, with the hierarchy behind the categories. The, cate the categories themselves still contain uh, things I wouldn't like to see go simply because rights to housing and healthcare and food and education, I, I think they're still at a stage where, at least in popular discourse, they're, they're not understood as rights and it would be a disservice to that social learning to simply kind of cloud the category itself um, as just a human rights category. Um, and so that's why I'm uh, editing this handbook is kind of resurrecting the category of economic and social rights with the caveat that what we're looking for is different obligations that, that, um, that state parties um, have to respect, protect and fulfill them. Muchísimas gracias. Y en, en, digamos, en seguimiento a, a esa respuesta. To follow up to that I, question. There's another group of people wondering if the principle, if this principle can be applied to social rights. And if they cannot see a second hand rights. And if this principle, although it has advantages, it also poses certain disadvantages, such as when you will adjudicate social rights, one of the most recurring arguments is how much money do we have? The issue we're talking about uh, about rights against dollars or rights against the money. So it seems that social rights, uh, it's not clear that they're right or fundamental rights, but they're also extremely expensive. And they need a big budget vis-a-vis uh, -vis other rights. When it seems that the defense of civil political rights, if we continue with that distinction, is also pretty onerous. And it also demands a budget, but it's just not that evident or it is not necessarily we don't use those arguments so the question is if you find any link between the principle of pr progression and the first level of the cost of costs whenever we're speaking about social rights thank you for that question uh yes yeah, so the the question about budgets and money is of course a, a huge question for all rights, but economic and social rights implicate expenses to a greater degree. Uh, not always, sometimes the disputes do not implicate great expense and sometimes they implicate no expense unless you take into account opportunity costs, you know, uh, a very uh, elaborate architecture of, of counterfactuals. But the, the um, idea in international human rights law has been that economic and social rights are protected according to maximum available resources. So the, the, the obligation is pegged to one of whether the state has the resources to expend. Um, and then the minimum core idea was supposed to carve out a special place, place of protection that was not qualified to the same extent. Uh, and then various uh, arguments were made as to, you know, why should a minimum core of a right look different in Malawi compared to Canada when it's still a human person who's who's um, in in need of basic basic material um, services or goods? Um, so the formulation progressive realization and maximum available resources has undergone an immense amount of scrutiny by economists and others. I think Olivia de Schutter and Rodrigo Uprimni. Um, have issued some really fantastic analyses of how to assess maximum available resources. Does one assume that the pie is the same and then you, you carve out the pie differently? Or do you actually think about how tax and spending has been established, how a budget is set, um, you know, whether there have been windfalls in some players, uh, you know, according to um, a certain uh, 
you know, economic ideology of trickle down, for example, that actually has to be called into question because there are rights commitments. Um, so I think um, Olivia Deschuda's work has been very useful to kind of pull back the curtain of how a budget is set and allow some inquiry as to whether resources are not being distributed the way they should be, particularly given how many resources that that state has available to it. You know, something, some, a place like Nigeria with incredible resources coming in from oil um, should be held to a greater account for the violations of economic and social rights going on according to the maximum available resources standard. Um, and Olivia Deschuda is someone who really stresses maximum available resources. So you can't hide behind uh, you know, other arguments when the resources are there but, but being misallocated. Um, so it's a useful uh, doctrine to look at um, uh, um, and both of these authors have, have published in, in my book on economic and social rights to kind of defend a view of assessing resources in that way. And the literature does look very different than it did 10 years ago. I mean, I think these inquiries are being taken much more seriously. Um, I think that uh, uh, there are international dimensions to this. I mean, COVID shows that as well, that even isolating a particular state and assessing how well it's doing with its resources can uh, forget that there are there's a global economy at play and every economy is integrated. And so it's not enough to hold a state to account simply for misallocating the resources that it has available when that state is operating under such pressures to, to join and play the rules of the global economy. Um, and so the, the authors that are looking to maximum available resources are also looking to the idea that economic and social rights do establish requirements of international cooperation and assistance. Um, so that's the text of the covenant, which from its earliest beginnings did envis envisage some kind of pressure on the social and international order to um, formulate a trading regime and um, a financial regime that, that didn't impoverish certain countries already from the get-go. So uh, a, lot of, a lot of scholars are working at that space um, to look at the pressures on resources from an international viewpoint. Some scholars are going back to asking big, big questions about the internet, new international economic order and where economic and social rights uh, played a part there. Um, others are looking to new treaties on um, on base tax erosion and other ways that that countries are cooperating multilaterally in ways that they hadn't to ensure that you know taxes aren't, aren't um, there is an uh, illicit um, tax evasion going on that there are the structures within the global economy that allow states to retain their resources. So that this is a space where there's a lot of work going where it's not simply the question, this is too expensive for a country, um, but rather it's a, a kind of a, a deeper question of, you know, why are, why are we seeing such incredible inequality between countries? And why is it that in countries where there are resources available, we're still seeing such inc incredible inequality in, in relation to who's enjoying their rights and who, who isn't? Um, but those questions are on the table, but they're by no means answered. Um, uh, but you're certainly seeing so much of a change in the questions being asked in the last 10 years. Um, uh, and I think that's because of a real sense, even, uh, even before COVID, that you know, a, a neoliberal framing will miss a lot of what the state has to do in order to allow its uh, people living within it to flourish. And so those kinds of questions were kind of locked down a little bit with the hegemony of neoliberal policies, but we are seeing them kind of bubble up in, in different ways now. Muchísimas gracias. Y en, en seguimiento con de esto que tú acabas Thank de you. decir. And to follow relación. on what you just said, Following up on what you just said about the questions on the table, the new questions we are formulating now, there are new questions provoked by an author 
And this is a question from the audience. They want to know how you feel about the idea that social rights are not enough or that literature developed in terms of that after Samuel Moyne's work. And the question is that, is the thesis, well, the thesis is that social rights are important, but it seems there's a whole doctrine behind and a whole effort for guaranteeing the minimum, right? Whatever is needed to subsist. But the most important ambitions and egalitarian ambitions that inspired initially social rights were left aside as an issue of non-democratic societies or something that says that equality is not an issue whenever we're speaking of social rights. And I will try to combine this question to another recurring question so we do not leave them behind. So please feel free to respond as you may. This is specific about, specifically about South Africa. South Africa had a transitional justice process. So the, the, the question is how important was the discussion about social rights within the transition of the justice system? As part of the transition, did you contemplate the provisions of well being as an object of discussion? or were they not discussed back then, but just left aside as problems that could be dealt with afterwards within a constitutional or superior legislative effort? And so perhaps these are very broad questions, but feel free to answer as you may. Thank you for those great questions. So I'll take um, first the literature that uh, Samuel Moyne has pro provoked about a certain minimalism in human rights and then the South African question. So the, the minimalism, I've actually reviewed Sam Moyne's book um, and I think it's a very provocative thesis that human rights have ignored egalitarian concerns. And uh, you know this his second book, his first book was that economic and social rights hadn't been uh, given due importance. The second book is that when they had been given importance, all they were concerned about was sufficiency and minimalism. And I think that is a correct characterization of many US-based human rights movements. Uh, and he's not the first to critique them, but I think that they, um, you know, they're a self-reflective lot, but they do deserve a lot of criticism for focusing on civil and political rights at the expense of integrating economic and social rights. I guess the grassroots movements in the global south that I'm familiar with um, and also some in the global north have always been focused on economic and social rights. So I think that the US came late, the US based human rights um, groups, particularly the very big ones came late to the table. But the human rights activism that was taking place was one that was very much concerned with economic and social rights and very concerned not to be too minimalistic about it. Um, now, I myself cr criticize the minimum core uh, doctrine as minimalistic um, as well. So I kind of agree with him on the point that the minimum core doctrine can be co-opted by neoliberalism to allow for some minimalistic transfers at the end of the day to the absolutely most disadvantaged, most vulnerable, the, you know, the least well off and allow the entire structure of um, exploitation and aggregation towards the rich to continue and thereby really risk the egalitarian promise of, of social democracy. Um, and so I agree that the minimum core has this tendency to um, impose a non-reformist requirement that, of simple redistribution after, after the fact um, and allow structures of inequality to persist. Um, and that, that was my big critique of the minimum core standard. I don't think that it necessarily has that effect, but I did worry back in 2008 that it would have that effect under conditions of neoliberalism. Um, that said, even as I was crit critiquing the minimum core, I think there were many agitating for far more egalitarian interpretations of all of the rights. Um, the right to healthcare, for example, doesn't make sense or well, many people said that uh, a right to healthcare had to take it into account of what services were being available on the private 
uh, healthcare market in private hospitals, um, private doctor's offices, and compare that with what's available in the public health sector. Um, obviously, there's countless models of how healthcare is financed and the division between private and public is a very rough one. Um, there's all sorts of all sorts of financing uh, at, at hand, but those advocates were very much interested in the egalitarian features of healthcare and not some minimalistic standard. Equally around water, which was uh, based on, you know, the right to water was recognized by the General Assembly um, very late, um, but it has been recognized now for almost two decades. Uh, and in that recognition is an understanding that water uh, distribution has to be egalitarian. It cannot simply be a kind of after the fact compensation to those who are missing out, but it goes into the whole egalitarian structure of water provision. And there are various um, very heated debates around the role of privatization. That's not a settled question around the right to water. Um, similarly, the right to education. Um, many have said that it makes no sense to think of the right to education in a minimalistic way if education is about not only ensuring literacy, basic reading skill, but you know, creating the, the human citizen to become um, an involved member of society, then it has to have egalitarian ambitions. Um, and, and if there is a far better education a service provided for those who can pay for it at the top, um, then the right to education has to change in quality. It has to meet what's provided at the top. So in that sense, it's a, a relative um, uh, uh, good and service, not simply a base minimum baseline. So there are all these discussions, you know, as you look into every um, contestation and defense of economic and social rights, you see egalitarian uh, aims are always uh, stipulated. Um, and um, you, you rarely see a social movement content with a very minimalistic definition. Um, so I take issue with the with the book um, in terms of its accuracy in describing human rights movements outside of the United States. Um, but I think it's great to be provocative. So I think it has engendered a lot of scrutiny because I think even with these pronouncements, we can um, attack uh, the anti-egalitarianism of many policies, um, you know, really vigorously. Um, you know, inequality is, is escalating um, in many parts of the world. And uh, I think human rights has to be part of that conversation. In terms of um, the question about South Africa and its transitional justice, so the South African constitution is obviously a product of compromise at the end of apartheid. And there were various groups around the table arguing over what should and shouldn't be included. But the idea of um, the injustice of apartheid and the incredible um, legacies that have been felt through poverty and economic inequality uh, was such that one had to recognize economic and social rights in order to kind of transform the system from its racist past. So it was not enough to declare a constitution that was anti-racist or a constitution that was um, uh, uh, based on civil and political rights and a new freedom. Uh, the, those drafting the constitution were adamant that economic and social rights had to be included, um, housing, healthcare, education, and uh, social security, uh, food and water, and children's rights. Um, so those were kind of part of the, uh, the, the resulting um, compromise. Many crit critics thought that that would give too much power of courts. So it wasn't the criticisms did not sound in the idea that no, no, we're not concerned with human well-being. That's for a different document. Those critics of economic and social rights were really concerned about the institutional reconfigurations that would occur um, and whether the courts could really stand up to the responsibility that was going to be asked of them. Um, and so you know, Group Boom assumes its its place is canonical now because the court did step up and, and recognize a, a right to housing in the terms that I've described. Um, and uh, it mentioned explicitly the legacies of apartheid in upholding the right to housing. You know, what apartheid had left, which incidentally was, um, you know, well, what was a cause of massive human displacement um, and then movement afterwards. So housing was not an easy 
policy area for the court to wade into, um, but it was recognised as just answering the legacy of, of that period. Thank you very much. And finally, because we're reaching, we're reaching the end of our time together. There are several questions about the test of proportionality and social rights. Yesterday, we had a couple of conferences questioning the universality of the test of proportionality, if perhaps it can be used in, in the same way in different contexts, or if the figure of importing the test uh, changes from one legal reality to another, specifically in a, such a different areas such as social rights. And there are also questions if the principle of progression and the idea of reasonability, doesn't it make us make them vulnerable when the test of proportionality is applied? Because it seems that they're always available. We can always have a good uh, budget arguments, but the argument of budgets and insufficient resources is always there or lack of financial resources is ever present whenever applying the test. So the question is if shouldn't we use another constitutional adjudication tool whenever there's a conflict regarding social rights? Yeah, thank you. So these are um, technical questions and I'm, I, I know you're going to have a lot of other speakers at, at these days of conferences um, that will also be answering many of these questions. But in terms of the universality of the test, um, I, I find that proportionality is effective when it's contextualized and when each inquiry is, is answered in context. And I guess South Africa's example is one in which even the structures, the four stages, of the inquiry or the three stages, if you want to count it that way, um, was not felt to be uh, appropriately imported to South Africa. So a very sophisticated constitutional court in the first generation um, after apartheid, um, you know, an incredible court decided not to mechanically apply that uniform three stage or four stage test, but instead make a, a global judgment about it. Um, even Alexi has suggested that the test is useful for scholars assessing the work of judges in reaching their decisions, but not necessarily, you know, mechanically applied by judges. So I think in that sense, it seems to be, um, you know, an exercise in, in examination um, and a discipline for examination that doesn't look the same in every in every context. It's kind of a heuristic for decision making that helps one ensure that the, the, the those most impacted by a decision are acknowledged to be have been impacted, and insofar as it's possible, avoided um, being impacted in that way. Um, so that's the a sense in which I get of the universality or uniformity. I know it's been described as the new global model for human rights, but I think it's. It's more um, a, a convenient heuristic for thinking about impact um, when perhaps not every piece of fact is available, um, but you see um, people claiming particular rights have been infringed and one needs an inquiry to see whether that was proportionate in the circumstances. Um, so uh, I guess that's a, I guess all ideas can be, helpful applied in new contexts um, and then they transform themselves. Um, I think proportionality is a very useful heuristic, but I wouldn't I wouldn't expect it to look the same in every in every court in every situation. Um, and South Africa proves that. Um, the idea of retrogression and the most vulnerable when there are a lack of resources, I still think proportion, so it depends on what you're comparing proportionality to, you know, how are the courts going to assess that otherwise? 
um, you know, again, I mentioned originalism. <laughs> Are you going to look to the original meaning of a clause and um, just suggest that it always has to maintain, um, you know, the, the textual meaning at the time that it was entrenched and not budge on new claims, you know, not allow it to evolve? I, I don't think that's going to necessarily, you know, that approach would necessarily help the most vulnerable when there are lack of resources on the line. Um, and again, originalism in the US occupies a place with a more than 200-year-old um, constitution. In other um, jurisdictions, originalism doesn't pull back the dead hand of the past in quite the same way. But proportionality compared with, with other doctrines of interpretation may have a greater transparency for its impact on the vulnerable when there are a lack of resources. And remember, proportionality isn't straight utilitarianism. It's not looking at um, resources have to maximize social welfare, and therefore we will always spend on where we can, you know, optimize welfare in that sense. There's also an inquiry as to how is this um, exercise in resource distribution impacting the most vulnerable? Um, and that's not a feature of straight out utilitarianism. It doesn't look exactly like the models of, you know, Dawkinian rights that we the, we might have thought we were inheriting, but that I don't think was ever going to be um, transportable to economic and social rights. Um, and even Dworkin would have applied a, a, a quality of resources framework that would, would have looked quite different. So yes, um, that hasn't been a long answer, but I, I I guess one compares to what the alternative would be. Proportionality has a certain promise, and I, but I wouldn't guarantee that um, as it's applied in particular places, it doesn't assume, um, you know, a really regressive role. I think that's that's a possibility with proportionality, um, as with with any kind of disciplinary tool that we expect judges to apply. Thank you very much, Professor Young. We have come to an end of this uh, of this event. Thank you very much for joining us, for being so detailed and so deep in your presentation as well as with with your simplicity and with such clarity as you did. And I would like and that you draw drew attention to a topic that we undermine, you know, whenever speaking about social rights, the test of proportionality and the different tools we use whenever we're dealing with constitutional social rights. I also want to thank everyone involved in this conference in the court website over the platform and we'll be here waiting for you in half an hour for our next conversation with professors Juan Antonio Cruz Parcero and Juan Antonio Garcia Max so we'll see you in just a bit thank you very much can I thank the interpreter too please <laughs> I imagine that's a huge effort. Uh, so thanks to the interpreter and everybody on board. Thank you. And You're very kind. Thank you, Professor. You're welcome. All right. Bye-bye.